Hello everyone. In this second video on aspects of theory of marketness, we will be discussing few more aspects and a detailed account of the concept called marketness. In the previous video, we have had a knowledge on the background of the theory, also some major works. Now let us move on to the next topic. Unmarked values of a market in a scale or division are cross-linguistically preferred and basic in all grammars. These two are important points, preferred and basic. While on the other hand, marked values are cross-linguistically avoided and used by grammars only to create con contrast. Okay. For example, subsistency was proposed as a universal condition on syntactic movement rules and obligatory contour principle as a universal condition on phonological rules. You are probably familiar with the ob obligatory contour principle which states that no morpheme is allowed to contain two consecutive high tones. Two consecutive high tones are not allowed within a single morpheme. Similarly, subsistence specifies restrictions placed on movement and regards it as a strictly local process. So these kinds are or these rules are uh, actually cross-linguistically not favored or uh, you know uh, some kind of markedness distinctions are ruled here. All languages have unrounded front vowels such as E and A. These are very common in languages but only a subset of languages contrast these vowels with rounded front vowels such as E and U. So you are probably familiar with these vowels from the vowel di diagram in the IP chart. And you are probably also aware of the fact that E and A are unmarked, that means more cross-linguistically preferred and also basic in their nature. So in contrast to E and U, in contrast to these two vowels, E and A are more cross-linguistically present. Hence the unmarked value for the distinctive feature round is minus round for front vowel. So if there is a front vowel, it has to be minus round, that means unround. If it is a back vowel, it has to be plus round. So for the frontness of vowels, the distinctive feature round is responsible, but the value should be minus. So this statement is very important. For us to remember and understand. At a suprasegmental level, markedness also affects prosodic categories. For example, the markedness, uh, sorry, uh, the unmarked value for syllable closure, that means syllable end boundary, is open since all languages have open syllables like CV or just V. This is an onsetless syllable V, but this is this has an onset, while only a subset of languages allow closed syllables. So most of the languages or all the languages do have open syllables in their syllable inventory. But out of those all languages, only a subset of languages do allow closed syllables like CVC and VC or any other combination with a coda consonant at the syllable. So syllable closer open is the unmarked value for syllable structure. Okay. On the, on the other hand, closed or non-open is a marked value. The notion of markedness is not only relevant to sound system, but its principles have been proposed for morphological and syntactic systems as well. 
So prosodic uh, categories include pitch, loudness, rhythm, tone, and intonation. In, it's in regards to the first point in this slide. So what are the prosodic categories at the suprasegmental level? So pitch, loudness, etc. Then uh, in regards to the second point, we have this particular example, syllables like C, V, V, B, V, C, C, V. So all of these are unmarked because of their no presence of, a, of any coda consonant. On the other hand, C, V, C, V, C, V, V, C. So if, if a syllable ends with a coda, these are marked. Just the presence of a coda consonant makes a syllable marked as opposed to an unmarked open syllable. This point is very important to understand the nature of syllable structure in a cross-linguistic perspective. This approach of markedness of linguistic universality is built on two major assumptions. First, markedness is inherently a relative concept. That is, a marked linguistic element is not ill-formed per se, but only a comparison of comparison to other linguistic elements. So if you think that, okay, if this is a marked structure like a closed syllable, I think it will be ill-formed. If you think like this, then you are wrong. Marked structures are not ill-formed. They are also well-formed in languages. They are also allowed. They are also articulated but they are slightly more complex than the unmarked variant. So an open syllable like CV is unmarked, whereas a CVC closed syllable is a marked syllable. That's all, because markedness do not uh, does not tell us that certain structure is not allowed. It is allowed, but to some extent, it's the uses of these structures is restricted or sometimes not very favored in cross-linguistic terms. Secondly, what is marked and unmarked for some structural distinction is not an arbitrary formal choice but rooted in the articulatory and per perceptual systems. By the combination of these two factors, markedness allows an interpretation of universality that is fundamentally different from principles and parameters theory in which markedness has no substantive status in the grammar but functions as an external system of annotations on parameter values evaluating grammar's complexity so this is structural distinction that markedness is not an arbitrary formal choice. Marketness also allows an interpretation of universality that is fundamentally different as I said in principles and parameter theory and this gives us the evaluation of grammar as a complex structure. For the view of marketness as a criterion external to the grammar, it evaluates the complexity. And for, the, uh, for more elaboration on these two topics or uh, two issues, you can see Somsky and Halle's 1968 monograph or, or Keynes 1975 and 1981. I have given the reference list. At the end of this video, you can see that. Uh, also here, you can have a look on that. So Mary Louise Keen, you are already introduced to her in the first video. Uh, she had talked about Markedness as a theory, and this is a second work, uh, 1981, on a theory of markedness, some general considerations, and the case in turn. You can have a look at it at your convenience. Then there are a few interesting facts which I have uh, picked up, and you should also uh, get a grasp of these ideas. There is a concept called absolute universal. By the name itself, what means absolute? That means absolutely favored or absolutely present or there should not be any exception to that so any something universal and there is no exception to that so something like that so i language may contrast up to five levels of tone but not more or no more it is a statement given by ian medition in his 1978 work that is universals of tone it was published in Greenberg's 
book called Universals in Human Language. Then implicational universal is another aspect of markedness. It says that a differentiation of rounded vowels according to degree of aperture cannot arise as long as the same opposition is lacking for unrounded vowels. This is a statement taken from Jacobson 1941 war which we have already got an information in the first uh, video. Here is a recapitulation from the same. And then comes the statistical universal. So this states that if a language has only one primary fricative, its primary allophone is most likely to be S or S. You should be saying uh, pronouncing it as S. This appears in Nartes 1979 work called A Study in Phonemic Universals, especially concerning fricatives and stops. It's a very, very interesting paper on the uh, you know nature of fricatives. If a language has one primary fricative, so if a language got some information that it can select only one fricative, then most likely it, it will select S, not any other fricative. So this is a statistical universal because the authors or the researcher have, researchers have uh, worked on these kind of universals and then they have seen that uh, out of many languages in sound inventories, this is a pattern that the languages follow. Greenberg, Osud and Zinkins, this particular work published in 1963, Memorandum Concerning Language Universals, again published in Greenberg's Universals of Language in 1963, make use of some more distinctions of these kinds of universals. So here are three distinct categories or types of universal patterns, absolute, implicational and statistical. And here are a list of references that I have given in the slide. You can have a look at it. So most of them appear in the slides and here you will get a composite list.